first part of what's going to be my new series on bird watching. Now bird watching is something that I've always been into and my family has always been into. For pretty much as long as I've been alive, we've been going places to go bird watching. One of the big things that we do is every spring we'll go up to the shores of Lake Erie to see the big warbler migration, which is basically hundreds of these little birds called warblers will be flying north and they'll all rest on the shores of Lake Erie to feed and to rest to get up their strength before they go fly all the way north to Canada. And there's a lot of little swamp areas and little nature preserves around there specifically set aside for so people can go bird watching for these warblers. So we'll go up for a weekend every spring and then every time we'll go on vacation we'll always set aside a few days to go bird watching just to see what kind of birds there are wherever we're vacationing at. And just, you know, we'll go on little day trips around where we live to different lakes or different little like swamp areas. And there's actually a lot of places set aside, maybe not specifically for bird watching, but that are really great areas for bird watching because they're either, you know, state parks or just like little like county parks or just, you know, like just wildlife preserves or whatever you have. And it's just, there's always fantastic areas to go bird watching wherever you're at. So I thought I would make this little introduction to bird watching. It's definitely not going to be very in depth because I don't consider myself an expert bird watcher at all. I know there's people who are a lot more into it, who have spent a lot more years and a lot more money just, you know, going all over and really getting into it. And for me, my interest kind of waxes and wanes. For a few months, I'll be really into it and I'll be going on a lot of trips to go bird watching, either with my family or alone, or, and then it'll be like a year there, I'm not really that much into it, but it's always something, it's always been something that I've really enjoyed, and I thought that I could give you guys just kind of an overview on what you need to get started. Now, the two things I'm going to be going over today is some of the basic equipment that you'll be needing, and the two essentials for any bird watcher are a bird book and binoculars. You really can't do anything without these. Now binoculars, you can really spend anywhere from 50 bucks to hundreds and hundreds of dollars on a really nice pair of binoculars. But I've always been around the $100 range. My pair is a pair of Nikon. And these are about, they're about medium sized binoculars. I've seen a lot smaller binoculars, a lot bigger binoculars. But these, I really am actually happy with these. Now, the first thing that you'll notice whenever you're buying binoculars is it has these numbers on the side. I don't think you guys can see it but it says 7 by 35 and then it'll say 9.3 degrees. Now the first number, the 7, is the magnification or the zoom and it really just tells you, you know, how much it's going to magnify for you. And 7 is pretty standard for these. You can go anywhere from 7 to 9 up to 15, but 7 is a good number because it allows you to actually see the bird that you're looking at while still having a decent field of view. And that 9.3 degrees is your field of view, and that really depends on your zoom. So that means that, you know, whenever you're using your binoculars, what you can see is 9.3 degrees out of, you know, 360. Now, the second number, 7 by 35. 35 is the size of the lens, and that also affects kind of your field of view. But what it really does is affect the amount of light that's entering into your binoculars. So it affects how well you can see. So really, it's kind of a trade-off, whether you want a lot of zoom and a, and a small field of view, or not a lot of zoom, but you know, you can actually have a wide area that you're looking into. Now these binoculars, these are my sisters. These are bush now. As you can tell, they're a lot smaller than mine, which, you know, I mean, they're easier to use. They're not as heavy, because these guys, whenever you have them around your neck, it actually does get to you. It doesn't seem like it would, but whenever you're walking around for hours on a boardwalk, it kind, it kind of starts to hurt. Now some people get like these whole shoulder apparatuses that will distribute the weight for you, but I've never done this. But these smaller binoculars, you won't have that problem. Now these are different because this one you can actually adjust the zoom, so it's 7 to 15. There's this knob right here where you can go from 15 zoom all the way out to 7, which is what these are kind of stuck on. Now this doesn't have a field of view, on it because it's going to be changing, but at 7 it's going to be the same as this guy, which was the 9.3, and at 15 I'd say it probably goes down to maybe even below 4 degrees because it's really zoomed in. And the f I've, I've used these a few times just borrowing them, and I really like them, I think they're really good binoculars, but I don't really, I haven't ever come across a time when you need that 15 times zoom. 
Now this is 7 to 15 times 25, where 25 again is the size of the lens. So you're going to have a little bit less light coming in. And I haven't really noticed a big difference in that. Like I said, I haven't tried a ton of different kinds of binoculars, at least not a lot of different sizes or magnifications. But these two, like I would say that they're about compatible. My dad has a pair of Nikon like these, except they're smaller. And his, I believe, are 9 by 25. And they have a 5.6 degree field of view. So it's really just, it depends on what you're looking for. With the larger field of view, it makes it easier to find the bird that, you know, you're searching for. But again, you're not going to have the same amount of detail. You're not going to have the same zoom. So it might make it a little bit harder to identify. But with, a, you know, a smaller field of view, you do have to, you know, you have to actually know exactly what it is you're, you want to look at before you put the binoculars up to your eye because you're not going to have a lot of, you know, wiggle room, wiggle room to search around for it inside your binoculars. So it really, it just depends on what you're looking for and obviously everyone wants to know how much these are going to cost. Now these I actually got as a Christmas present probably about five years ago. I looked these up on Amazon and they ran $130. These are the Nikon Action. And that's not a bad price. I mean, if you're looking for binoculars and you're halfway serious about it, you're probably going to pay about 100 bucks for a pair. Now, these guys are Bushnell PowerView. And I researched these. These cost you 80 bucks. And then my dad has a pair of Nikon. He has the Nikon Travel Light 3, which they're a smaller version of Nikon, about these, except they're be Nikon. And those ran for about a hundred bucks. Right now they're at the Travelite 6, so because his are a few years old, so they've come out with three new versions of it since then. The new ones for those are a hundred dollars, which really isn't bad at all. And they work really well. He's really pleased with them. He's been birding for probably about 30 years or so, and those are the ones that he's ended up using. And I mean, he's not the kind of person who would invest hundreds of dollars in a pair of binoculars, but I think he definitely knows a good pair of binoculars when he sees them. So I would, I trust his judgment on those. So really that shows that you don't have to spend a ton of money on a pair of binoculars. There's a lot of different brands you can get. Like I said, we have Nikon, there's Bushnell. I know Bosch and Lom sells them. My mom used to have a pair of those. And I can't really speak to the quality of one brand over another. Obviously, all the ones that we've been using have been relatively cheap binoculars. So really the, you know, the price is going to you know, it'll affect the quality a lot more than I think the brand will. Nikon, it's not a fantastic brand, but it does the job. You can spend a lot more. If you're looking to buy a pair of binoculars, I like to test them out first, just because it's kind of good to know, you know, what the feel's going to be, especially if you don't have anything to compare them against. But you can always just order them online, you know, either through Amazon or through the actual, you know, websites of who you're buying. And you can kind of shop around. But then if you, you know, if you go to like probably like a Dick's Sporting Goods, a Gander Mountain, there's a lot of different places that are going to be selling binoculars. And I've never bought a pair there, but I feel like, you know, you might be able to get more help. You could talk to the associates. They might actually be able to walk you through it more, especially if you haven't done a ton of research beforehand. But, you know, there's obviously a lot more to binoculars, but if you're just getting started, that's really all you need to know. Kind of, you know, what kind of zoom you're looking for, what field of view you want. The size is a big thing for me just because, you know, you want to have something that's easy to carry around with you. I don't mind this. It can, like I said, it can get a little bit heavy, but I like the feel of these. It's nice to actually, I don't know, it's a very substantial pair of binoculars, and I'm really happy with these, so I'll probably be using these you know, for a long time before I actually am going to buy a new pair. But, you know, I mean, if you go online, you can find a lot more information on these. I looked on the Columbus Audubon website, which is, you know, it's the Audubon, which is a big birding society, and Columbus is where I live, so it was more local news. But it did have a very nice article on how to choose a pair of binoculars. So I'll put the link down below. And then if you just go to, like, Audubon or really... There's a lot of birding websites out there where you can find a lot more information on how to pick a nice pair of binoculars and what's best to use in what scenario. Alright, now the second thing that you really need when you start going bird watching is obviously a bird book. And there's a ton of different kinds of bird books that you can use. What my mom uses is a Peterson Field Guide. This is for Eastern and Central North American birds. So it is a very wide range. We live in the Midwest in the United States. So 
you know, there's a lot of birds in here that don't actually live around this because, you know, this will go all the way down to the Gulf Coast, all the way out to, you know, like Kansas, Oklahoma, and we don't get a lot of those birds around here. But it's still, you know, it's not a large book. You can still comfortably carry this with you. So it, it's not really a big problem that it has a ton of birds in here that we don't get. Now, the organization of most bird books is going to be the same. I personally use a Kaufman bird guide, and I like it because it actually has photographs of the bird in it. A lot of, like, Peterson field guides, a lot of, like, older field guides will actually have sketches. Like, if, you're, if you can see this, you know, those aren't photographs of owls, those are just drawings. But that really allows them to highlight the distinctive features of the bird. And, and the one that I have with the photographs, they are digitally altered, so they have them in the best poses, they don't have any obstruction. They still have the little arrows pointing out what to look for, how to identify it. And I find that easier just because that's what I'm used to, because I've had that bird guide for a long time. But Peterson, Audubon, those are definitely more well-known bird guides than Kaufman, I think. So you can go whatever, with whatever you're comfortable with. Now, I mean, most bird books are going to have a pretty consistent organization. I mean, if you're flipping through this, you know, it starts out with ducks and, like, d dabbling birds. And then you're going to go into hawks and birds of prey. And then you're back into shorebirds. And it's not, I mean, it's really easy to navigate because, in addition, they have the, they have an index in the back. And then a lot of them will also have a more condensed index just if you're looking for, like, hawks. And you can just find the section on hawks. And most of the time, you know, after using it a couple times, you're going to remember the order that the birds are in. And you're going to be able to flip things pretty easily. Now, most bird, bird guides like this will have a pretty consistent, you know, layout. They'll have the actual pictures of the birds on the right. And normally they'll have, you know, anywhere between like four, six, eight birds per page, depending on, you know, the size of the birds, the similarities between them how many like variations there are between immature male, female, or fall and spring. Most of the time they'll have that kind of variation. I don't know if you guys can see this, but here we have some warblers like I was talking about earlier. And you'll have like the male and the female, and then you also have like a fall variation and the spring variation because most of the time the males will have a big difference between fall and spring because in the spring they'll be going into mating season, they want to have their spring plumage you know, they're going to be really bright, and towards the fall, they'll look more like the females, they'll look more like the juvenile birds. So, you're going to have the different variations. Most of them will also have, it'll have a brief description of their key um, distinguishing features, either they have a cap or like an eye stripe or their flight patterns or something that really distinguishes them from other similar birds. They'll also have a, something about their song, this will be says voice. A very high, thin, seat, 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 easily confused with the song of the bay-breasted warbler. So most of the time you're going to have to actually hear the birds. The voice description isn't super helpful if you've never heard anything similar to that before. But if two birds, you know, have, if they have similar markings but very different calls, that can definitely help identify them. It'll have their range, you know, Canada, northeastern edge of U.S., winters in Caribbean area. And then sometimes it'll say, like, has occasionally been seen in this area, but that's not its actual, you know, nesting ground, or that's not actually part of its usual range. It'll sometimes, you know, say like it's been, like it's an accidental bird. Sometimes it'll just show up somewhere, but where you are isn't really part of its range either. And it'll, you know, it'll kind of lead you along there and kind of tell you where it'll usually be found. And then a lot of them will also have little tiny maps on the side. And this one I like because it has a smaller map, but then also if you flip to a page in the back, it'll have much larger maps for each bird, so you can see, you know, like, blue will be where it usually is, or pink will be, you know, where it winters, or where it'll have, it's been seen occasionally. And that's helpful, because, I mean, if you think it's a certain bird, and you realize that it's in a completely different area of the world, then that definitely can't be what you're looking at. And then, you know, it'll have, you know, its habitat, whether it likes living in forests or swamplands, or sometimes it'll say, like, it lives high up in trees, or it, like, prefers prairie. And that's like, helpful also, because you'll know, like, where you want to look for this bird at. And it'll also tell you how common it is. And it's, you can always get more in-depth bird books. Like, there's bird guides, 
just for Ohio because I live in Ohio so we have a few bird guides that are specifically for Ohio so it'll have a lot fewer birds in here but it'll have a lot more information on those birds and it'll tell you, you know about like their nesting patterns it'll have a ton more information which can really help if you know that you're going to be sticking to a specific area and you don't want to invest in your know, book for the entire like I don't know like United States or if you live in Europe I don't know a ton about the birds in Europe, but you don't want to get something for all of like Eastern Europe or Western Europe. You want to get something specific to your region. So that's nice. And there's there's so many different bird guides you can get. Like I said, I like Kaufman. I like Peterson. We've kind of stuck to the basics here. But again, you kind of need to do more research on your own. Just kind of figure out the style that you like, whether it's a specific you know artist that you like, a specific brand whether you want something just for your area, whether you want something more all-encompassing. And then when we've gone on vacation, a lot of times, like we went to North Carolina this spring, or this summer, and you can get, you know, little pamphlets there that'll show their common birds. Or you could pick up something like a cheap bird book for like maybe 10 bucks at the store that'll just have, you know, like maybe like 20 to 50 pages on just like North Carolina birds. And that can be helpful, especially if you know that you're going to be visiting that area a lot more. And, I don't know, I mean, it may make it pretty simple to identify these things. It takes some practice to know what to look for because most of the time when you're looking at a bird, you only have, you know, maybe you only have a few seconds before it flies away. So you have to know to get an idea of just figuring out what size it is, you know, figuring out any distinctive markings, its song, its flight pattern. And then you have to come out with it all to memory and then hurry up and look it up before you forget it. Because it's not all the time that you're going to have a chance to actually open up your bird guide while looking at a bird and say, okay, does it have this eye ring? Does it have this? And the certain birds are a lot harder to identify than others. I mean, gulls are nearly impossible to identify because most seagulls will look the same. But a lot of warblers, especially in the spring, will be very brightly colored. You see a flash of, you know, red or purple and you can figure out what it is most instantly. Same thing, you know, for hawks. A lot of hawks will look the same, like a cooper's hawk a, and um, a goshawk, and there's another one that pretty much all look the same. So it takes a while. I mean, I'm not that great at it either, it, but it definitely takes a lot of practice to figure out what to look for and how to identify it. And just, you know, it, it just takes practice. But I hope that this was sort of helpful. I definitely didn't get to everything, so like I said, there's a lot more information on the internet. There's, you know, there's whole website. There's whole, whole communities of people who have been into bird watching and who have put a ton of effort into this and they've written a lot about it. So definitely go and read that. This is just meant to be a short kind of beginner's instructional video for bird watching. It's definitely not all encompassing. But in later on episodes, I'm going to be discussing different kind of bird feeders and bird feed to attract different birds for birding at home. I'm going to be talking about like tips for whenever you're actually out bird watching and what to bring with you and tips for identifying birds and talking about different habitats for different birds and just trying to trying to give an overview for most aspects of bird watching that you'll need to know. So hopefully this was helpful and I would love for you guys to give me some feedback on what you liked and what you didn't like because this is my first attempt at making an instructional video of this kind. So definitely give me some feedback and I can try to implement that into my the later on episodes of this little series that I'm doing. So thank you for watching and I hope that this was useful.